everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this panel discussion for CHAPS Unite Against Racism. Our topic today is equity in education. Uh, my name is Nicole Matos, and I'm currently the Interim AVP for Assessment and Student Success, and I'm here to help facilitate the discussion among our panelists. So um, I will ask each of them to introduce themselves first and say a little bit about their role at the college. And then, you know, if they could also say something about what first got them interested in equity work in higher education, that would be a good way to get things started. So Sunshine, you happen to be first on my uh, Zoom rotation, so I'll start with you. Hello, I'm Sunshine Ballantyne. I am a part-time counselor here at the College of DuPage. Um, I guess I first got started with equity work um, even when I was in, in elementary school. I always wanted to help people. I always wanted to be a school counselor. So I'm one of the few people that knew that this is what I wanted to do since I was very young. But along the way, I felt like I was very blessed to have a good support system at home, um, a good support system around my teachers, um, mentors, and I know growing up that that's not something that a lot of people had. So I kind of felt like it was my responsibility, um, having been blessed with so many good examples and good role models to look up to, to give back to other people um, and to take as much as time as I can to impart any little bit of knowledge or um, help to other students. So thank you so much, Sunshine. Jason, you're next. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Snart. I've been at the college for almost 20 years now, which is hard for me, at least, <laughs> to believe. I'm a professor of English there and the chair of literature, creative writing, and film. Um, and I'm not really sure how to answer your uh, opening question, Nicole, about what got me interested in equity work. Um, I feel like the answer would be too long and rambling to even try to provide it. But I don't feel like I ever really like got interested or declared to myself that I was starting equity work. I think it's sort of been threaded through my entire teaching career, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about teaching and learning experiences for students and making those experiences accessible and inclusive and the teaching and learning space as an equitable space. So I feel like it's kind of been part of what I've done, even if I haven't named it that per se. Um, if anything, I think I've gotten better at naming it and thinking more intentionally about it as a, as a, a concept rather than just letting it infuse kind of what I do. Um, and I would also say that uh, the nature of equity work itself is it has to be ongoing. So it's never done or complete. Um, so it, it feels like it's it's fresh almost every day for me, honestly. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, Diana, how about you? Well, uh, good afternoon. I am Diana de Rosario, and I serve the college as the assistant provost for student affairs. And my uh, way to answer the question, I think that I gain awareness of inequity, um, somewhat similar to what Sunshine mentioned. As a child, I knew what inequity was. But being able to do work and start addressing inequities, um, I didn't get to do some of that work probably until I was in college through um, connecting socially through clubs and organizations. And then in my real work in higher education and, and college for me, led me to decide that I was going to work in higher education. So I think that that was kind of stepping stones of how my life has allowed for me to tackle inequity through education. Um, but we'll talk more as we go into other questions. Thank you so much. And Anthony. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Ramos, and I am the uh, Interim Dean for our Arts, Communication, and Hospitality Division. Excited to be with you all today. Um, you know, when I, I think about when I first started thinking about the significance of equity in, in higher education, um, it was probably graduate school where I started reflecting a lot on my undergraduate experiences. And to me, I just lived those experiences. Um, 
you know, I remember working a lot. I remember struggling in school, but I didn't understand the larger systemic issues that maybe contributed to um, some of the challenges that I faced to having a uh, deeper understanding as to how uh, that might manifest on um, more larger scales. And, and I think as um, uh, I like to say that I, I grew up through the different uh, student affairs and academic affairs roles I've had within my time in higher education. And I think one experience that I could remember being so powerful for me was uh, a bridge program I worked on at a four-year institution uh, where I saw the power of uh, intentionally designed uh, approaches to student onboarding, instruction, and support really making a difference for um, students who didn't think that college was for them or um, that thought that they were deficient in ways because of communication that they've received externally, but yet with the proper support, uh, were able to thrive uh, and really be successful and um, really could have encouraged me to seek opportunities to serve in, in ways in education. And that's where I found the transition to community colleges to really think about the institutions where we really live this mission and purpose in uh, equity in higher education. And so, um, you know, th those are some of the things that uh, excite me about this work, but also uh, remind me of the, the, the challenges that we have in, in trying, to, um, trying to work uh, to create more equitable environments for student success. Yeah, and I think that makes a perfect transition, Anthony, into the next question I was thinking about. You know, you spoke about, um, you know, living that mission, right? Um, and the idea that the community college is a really unique place for that. Um, and I think Jason spoke about sort of equity work being threaded, you know, all through his work. And actually, everyone on the panel so far has spoken to that. Um, but, you know, if folks wouldn't mind saying a little bit more, you know, specific to the community college, uh, what makes this place, you know, within higher ed, such an important crucible for these issues? I'd be happy to jump in. And I, I believe community colleges were designed uh, intentionally to be that open door. They are democracy colleges. And I think that um, intentionally many institutions have worked to make that part of their mission, uh, creating equitable environments. Uh, programming also, you know, is established through multiple doors in a community college setting. We have programs that allow people to start without having a high school diploma or a credential. Uh, and then allowing anyone to be able to enter our academic programs as long as they have proof that they have completed some type of, um, in our credit side, equivalency for um, high school diploma or a high school diploma. So there's, there's that opportunity for us to be a welcoming door and the next step to either transfer or employment. And workforce is part of our mission and community is part of our mission. So I think that um, this is the type of environment that levels the playing field for many students who kind of make it to a four-year university. And also from a student's perspective, um, this level is either the start of it all for them or it could be the end of it all. Um, and when I'm talking to students in conversation, you know, a lot of times they're intimidated about starting something new. Uh, maybe they had some aspirations to go other places, but they're trying this out. Um, they may be first generation college students. They may be... Um, starting a whole new career after having been into the world of work. So we see so many different types of people here at College of DuPage. And, and this is where it all begins. This is where the hope for a new life, something better starts. And, and it's such a powerful place because it can be a gateway, but it can also be a holding place or a place where those dreams end, depending on how we take advantage of the opportunities that we have. So we really need to work hard to connect those students with those resources. I am. Um, I really appreciate that thought, uh, Sunshine. You know, I think sometimes, you know, the history of community colleges has been that it can be a first chance for so many students. Um, it can sometimes be a last chance for so many students. But I think increasingly, we're trying to be all the chances in between as well, you know, uh, including the idea that there is no such thing as a last chance. You know, uh, there are iterative, iterative chances 
um, that we're trying to provide. Uh, but, you know, I think that's all really important to thinking about how we become, uh, as Diana said, you know, more democratic, how we serve the community, how we serve the citizenship uh, as a democratic institution. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that, Nicole, because we, we are the community's college. And perhaps that may be some of the challenge in this work is that um, we have to be responsive to the needs of so many different experiences that walk through our doors. And it, it's our responsibility to be open access and to be in service to the community, whether folks are coming to us for lifelong learning, for certificates, transfer opportunities. There's so many ways that we are called as uh, the community college to, to serve. And, and I think that's the exciting part of the, the work, um, but also a uh, challenge as we think about how do we navigate um, the, the equity issues because the, the mission of open access on which community colleges were founded uh, is evolving uh, as uh, the, you know, the mission of success. And uh, I know there's talk about the you know, uh, soon success being the North Star for community colleges. And that that's really what we're shooting for is to embrace what we were founded on in that open access mission. But now what's our responsibility as educators to provide the support, uh, to provide the education on, you know, a lot of times I think we're not just um, providing education, but also teaching how to navigate that experience of education. We're teaching students uh, the curriculum of our courses, but also how to do college. I think that's a, a conversation that is evolving in this work of um, especially navigating this environment for folks who never thought college was for them or uh, maybe didn't receive those messages, be it from family members who didn't go to college, um, and so Chen was talking about first generation college students or um, even from their, uh, whether it be high school or other environments that um, may have given them different signals about what life after those experiences might be. And um, so it's, it's exciting to do this work. It's a big responsibility, but it comes with its challenges for sure. So, you know, of course, this all ultimately comes down to students, right? Um, and so I wanted to maybe try asking, you know, uh, what do you think in terms of um, what you've heard from students, what you've experienced in your interactions with students, how are students experiencing issues of equity here at the College of DuPage? Well, speaking from the counselor's role, we see a lot of students on a daily basis. Um, I think the majority of our students love being here at the College of DuPage. They look around and they see the hallways and they see the people and they're excited about being here. They feel really good um, to be here. Um, but as one student was, was kind of putting it to me, there are a lot of tools here at College of DuPage, but not all of them know which tools they need to use. Not all of them know where to find those tools. And even if they knew the exact person to, to have the conversation to get to where they need to go, they don't always know if they would be welcomed. Sometimes they feel like they need an introduction, a personal one-on-one -on -one introduction to be welcomed into that. Some of them wonder if what they say would be appropriate or, or if what they're thinking or feeling, is it real or is it just in their head? Those are some of the frustrations that I hear uh, students talk about, but they don't wanna seem ungrateful because they're really happy to be here, but they just want to feel invited in. They, wanna, they want someone there who they trust to guide them along the path. I was only gonna sort of echo um, Sunshine's sentiment that I, first I wish I knew more about what students thought and felt and experienced. And I think the more that we could get those voices into our conversations, the better. Um, but I think one of the things that I learn, you know, on a regular basis is that, especially for somebody like me, just because I feel like I'm open and inviting and willing to talk with students and I tell them that, it doesn't mean that that just flips the switch for those students and they are thus willing like to knock on my door or set up a Zoom call. Um, and so that's one of the interesting things that I've learned from students in you know face-to-face -face discussions, even in recent Zoom calls, where if they were struggling in a class or even had a basic question and they finally ask it, and I was like, why, why did you wait so long? I, I told you over and over, just send me an email. And they say, well, I was just, I was scared to. 
And I think just because I tell them, don't be scared of me or of someone in my position at the college, it doesn't mean that they are automatically thus not scared <laughs> or intimidated or whatever the right word might be. So it takes that, that messaging over and over. And again, as Sunshine said, it, it takes a certain kind of like introduction to that this is an okay thing. Like you can go to ask questions to that person, to that office, to that group, that department, that club, you can be part of that club. Just because we, we announce to students that it's an okay thing, it doesn't mean that they automatically internalize that and can act on it like the next, the next minute. I agree with everything that has been said by Sunshine and, and Jason. I think that the college does have uh, a certain sensitivity that we uh, should be proud of with allowing students to create their clubs and organizations. Uh, we have about 90 official clubs and organizations. And if you look through the list of how many are created based on groups that have commonalities, even if they are small groups, they have that option of creating and unifying people that have um, a common sense of community. And that probably opens the door for people like them who come in to see a name or a list of something they can join. So I admire, and, and that was something that actually attracted me to come to COD. I think that the other um, angle that I appreciate and I um, want to always listen for feedback and gain more knowledge is how do we financially support students because the economic impact, not only of the pandemic, but of uh, unemployment on our local community impacts like the students that are coming through our door. And the equity of financial support for students is really important to me. Um, so, you know, just last week I met with Student Leadership Council and I listened to uh, when we have panels, uh, make sure that I'm paying attention to what students are describing as high need. Um, I keep in touch with the team that is working in the fuel pantry because we know that the signs of increased need creates inequity on people being able to the, either take more courses or attend school if, if other priorities in their life are shifting uh, where they put their energy. So I think that maintaining kind of the way that Jason described, maintaining that mentality of encouraging feedback and uh, communication we have to be present and try to go for it and make it make make ourselves visible to be able to secure that information and hear uh, what is that students are experiencing. Uh, but in terms of uh, the financial angle, I think that leveling and providing more resources is something that we're trying to do better. And we're on a constant uh, quest for making things a lot more transparent for students. Just to build on that, uh, Diana, thinking about you know, the financial struggles that some of our students may experience and in a way that becomes like a double-edged sword at times as we experience students who at times are working to sometimes, uh, I had some students working for me once or that were uh, student leaders in a previous institution that were working three jobs. They had one student leadership job with me. They had an evening job and on the weekend they were doing something else uh, in support of their their families or uh, just to help pay for, for, for college. And then we also recognize that that time constraint on them decreases the ability for them to have that informal academic and social integration that you were talking about through the clubs and organizations and other involvement opportunities that we know that engagement in the college environment also is a contributor to student success. And so um, thinking about those challenges uh, can definitely contribute to how we see different groups of students maybe experiencing their collegiate uh, experience with us. One of the things that, that I was thinking about as you guys were, um, you know, saying everything you were saying so well is that, you know, we we have at least two experiences of students, right? I mean, we, we see each of us, you know, dozens, hundreds, even thousands of students uh, in the course of a year. And, you know, part of what we're trying to do in equity work is like looking across you know, broad data information, looking at students and demographic groups and trends and things like that. But then, you know, I think the heart of what we do and probably what drew us into the field of education in the first place is those one-on-one -on -one connections, right? And a few people have already talked about sort of the importance of being a person for students, right? 
And so, um, you know, I'm going to ask a question that's a little um, like tricky because it's a little less safe and I'm going to answer it first and I'll probably get choked up, but that's okay. Um, which is just, you know, can you think of any stories of sort of individual students or individual moments um, from your career in the community college that might express something about, you know, either the promises or the challenges of equity? Uh, and, you know, I'll give an example since I know, you know, it's a little more of a personal question. Um, but, you know, I uh, once asked a group of developmental writing students, um, you know, hey, you've got to do um, evaluations of all your professors all the time. And the college asks all kinds of questions and then you got to answer them, right? But like, here's a question I don't know if anyone has ever asked you, like, what do you wish your professors knew um, that they don't already know? And, at, you know, I was working at the time as a professor. So I said, what do you wish you could tell me that you're kind of scared to tell me? Um, and that, you know, speaks to you, Jason. And, uh, you know, we, we worked on that conversation and for quite a while. And the largest thing um, that came across or that I took away um, was students said, you know, please don't take our failures personally. Um, we get really scared and upset, like when you, you know, if you're angry with us for seeming not to meet a certain standard or, you know, sometimes we don't always tell the truth to our professors, our truth, you know, about how hard we're working or what our life challenges are or microaggressions that made us uncomfortable or whatever, because, you know, your mood or tone towards that, like has a lot of power over us, right? Um, and that was just a very important realization uh, for me and really important moment of listening. So I don't know, um, you know, as storytellers, um, does anyone want to sort of volunteer something that's more of a micro level in terms of an interaction with a student or group of students that taught you something? I'll go ahead and speak. Um, if I can share this, it's, it's personal to me when I think about the student. Um, and I asked her if I could share, so... <laughs> But uh, sh there's a student who had an assignment in a class where they were supposed to take a life experience that they learned something from and turn it into a fairy tale. Um, this student did something that was close to them, uh, everyday thing that happened on their block um, where they live. And she was very disappointed that her writing didn't get the grade that she expected. So she had a, an appointment with the teacher, sat down. The teacher said, this is good, but it, it just really wasn't what I was expecting. It was, it was far too real, um, a, a little too gritty. Um, I think you, you should have held some of that back, um, but I do think you're a good writer. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do better. Um, you can redo the paper. So the student, told me that you know, she was a little disheartened, but she really wants to do well. She looks at herself as a writer and wants to do that once she finishes college. So she said, okay, well, I better figure out how to do this again. She talked to other students, asked them, well, well how were you successful? What things did you use? And she took copious notes on that. She went to the writing center and um, got feedback from them as well. And the feedback was a little harsh for her she said that they told her she was a little too aggressive and that she needed to talk about the better things that happened and not dwell on the negative so much, have it be more positive and more upbeat. So she said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this because I'm gonna get this A on this paper. She wrote the paper with the suggestions, turned it in and got a really good grade. And she was happy about that. But the student told me that she felt silenced and she was mm -hmm. disheartened because she said from that moment forward, she realized that if she wanted to be successful, she had to leave who she was at the door, keep pushing and move forward. So when I was first introduced to her, she was talking about how excited she was to transfer to another higher institution. She said she's really excited about where she's going to go from here. But, you know, for her, it just disheartened me because 
what an opportunity lost to be able to support someone, to be able to show someone that we celebrate what you have, that your diversity, the richness of your experience, you know, it may be not be what we're expecting, but it's also valid and how much more we can learn from that experience in the classroom. So, you know, sometimes things like that happen and um, you just wish you could take it back and do it all over again, wrap your arms around that student and support them through, you know, what their next steps are. Um, but I was really glad that she was able to open up because, you know, how many students would would feel uncomfortable about sharing that? You know, there has to be a balance, uh, of course, with writing. We all have to refine writing for the audience in general. Um, but somehow we got to find a balance to be able to celebrate all of our differences and push that forward and be saying that in the mainstream, you know, have that be the promotion that, you know, you have to change who you are and you lose your voice. Often it comes towards the end of a semester when, you know, I've developed a rapport with students. They've been working on a project for an extended period of time and they've been challenged to do something really difficult and they've done it successfully. And they say some version of, I never knew I could do that. And I don't want to by any means take like personal responsibility for that. Um, but I think it is, part of the equity work of teaching is to design learning experiences where students can have more, um, more control, more say, more um, input on the direction that their learning takes and the audiences that they engage with to set the bar for themselves at a place that they need to, they need to reach that. It's not just doing something they already knew that they could do. So again, like one very recent or relatively recent uh, specific example was towards the end of a fall semester, I was in my office suite area so I could see the hallway out there. The door was open, a student zipped by. I knew who it was since we had been in class for the last 14 weeks together, went by one direction and then backed up because she noticed me in the office. And she says, hey, Professor Snart, I never knew I could do that before. And you know, we talked about her project. I was like, yeah, well, I didn't know you could do it either, but I'm glad that you <laughs> set the bar high and rose to that occasion. And I think sort of to piggyback on what Sunshine was saying with the first story, which is you know disheartening to say the least, is that the more that we can design or what I try to foreground in my own instructional design is to make sure that the work that students are doing, like in our field, Nicole of composition is authentic writing and composing and engagement with authentic audiences that mean something to each and every student. And part of that means that we have to um, kind of make more transparent like linguistic diversity and linguistic equity. Because if students are engaging with their meaningful communities, whether it's their literal community, the neighborhood they live in, organizations that they're a part of, if those groups of people don't communicate with one another in, in you know, white mainstream English, we can't force them to code switch from that authentic engagement to then demand something else in the academy. That's sort of like that inauthentic, you must leave yourself at the door or something like that, I think is what Sunshine uh, articulated. Like we, you can't leave that at the door. You have to bring that in and that has to be welcome. So I feel like on a very basic level, like instructional design for as wonky as that term sounds, that's equity work too, because it invites and allows and encourages students to engage with real audiences and use their communication tools uh, in, a, in a more linguistically diverse way. And then they race by your, your doorway and say, hey, I never knew I could do that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, I, I like that you started to segue into questions of instructional design. Um, and also, you know, the question of paradigm shifts, right? Like what are the paradigm shifts um, in higher education, in disciplinary fields, in different people's institutional roles? 
um, that have been most effective and most important in, in helping further the cause of equity. Um, so I thought I might call on a couple of people just to talk about individual roles. Um, so Anthony, um, your role right now, for example, is in administration as a dean, specifically right now, uh, fine arts and hospitality, and I'm forgetting the other one. So jump in, jump in with that one before I mess it up. Yeah, arts, uh, arts communication and hospitality. <laughs> Sorry, communication. You can send me angry emails later. My apologies. <laughs> uh, but Anthony, you know, I think sometimes, you know, the role of a dean is one that, at least in popular culture, is frequently misunderstood. Um, I'm always amused when I watch um, television shows that sort of posit deans in, in sort of bizarre ways, like either, you know, weird buffoons or mean principals, or I'm not sure exactly what, like accountants, I don't know. So, you know, I see you as a very visionary dean, you know, and one that is deeply invested in student success and equity and inclusion. So could you talk a little bit more about, you know, your role and, and what real deans do in terms of equity? Yeah, well, and, and admittedly, you know, I, I'm thinking a lot about what uh, Sunshine had said about students wa wanting to walk with us in this journey. And with me being relatively new in this role, I feel like I am walking this journey as as a dean and and thinking about how do we how do we bring equity work into uh, the academic spaces uh, admittedly i know there's more that i can be doing within my division as i'm learning our operations and supporting um, the great work that's done by our, our faculty i mean we've we've got so many uh, great programs transfer opportunities workforce development opportunities we have you know, programs that will get folks directly into to workforce. And so there, there's a lot of great opportunities. And so, um, you know, as I'm navigating this transition and in this leadership role for uh, for the college within my areas of responsibility, I, you know, I, I, I you know can start with kind of the the, the basic things of um, you know looking for professional development opportunities and and supporting that when my faculty uh, you know come to me and say hey there's this uh, thing on pedagogy within my particular discipline and I think that's the exciting thing uh, with where I, I'm at that we have so many varied disciplines within our division that what equity work looks like within the industry of fashion studies uh, could look very different in terms of how uh, they're approaching concepts of equity within uh, the arts program or in theater or in um, interior design. And so I, I think there's a, a lot of opportunities to support that work. And, um, you know, as I think of uh, opportunities or things that I might look to do in the future would be to create opportunities to engage in this in this conversation within uh, the leadership of the division with the department and, and program chairs and to think about how to do that more widely within the division. Um, I, I think part of that is also thinking about um, what do we do uh, to support equity from a curricular perspective from in terms of um, you know, the instructional piece, but then also the, the student onboarding um, and progression. How are students uh, progressing through our programs what barriers are they encountering in um, continuing on within the programs and on to uh, either workforce or transfer. So I think engaging in those conversations, um, creating a space to have those conversations are, are things that I would hope and look to do within this role. And, um, you know, in, in terms of the um, perceptions of, of Dean, so to speak, I, I mean, I hope from a leadership perspective and kind of walking through this that um, I'm creating spaces and opportunities to create collaborative uh, environments uh, for for my faculty and for uh, the opportunities for us to engage in this work. And so I, I look at it as being a leader within rather uh, than from above, because I, I'm navigating this too. And, and I can own that I don't know everything that has to do with equity in higher education and in community colleges, and and particularly leading on the expertise and knowledge that um, that that our faculty and and staff have within the division, and thinking about okay, well, how how do we how do we conceptualize and, and think about what equity means for us in our work in the space, uh, and then to build uh, some sort of pl uh, plans in terms of how do we how can we engage in this work more consistently in the future? What can I do to support that? 
um, and what what might be the opportunities moving forward for us as a as a division of the college and and particularly in, in the arts and communication and hospitality fields uh, within the academic world the uh, the industries that our our students are looking to becoming a part of um, you know there's there's a lot of great conversation that are happening within professional organizations academic organizations that um, some of our faculty are bringing back to me like this conversation is happening in our professional group here's some things that we might bring that translate that to the classroom or here's how that might translate to how we're doing um you know looking for four-year transfer opportunities that are affordable for our students and uh maybe their scholarships and other things that might be related to um these initiatives and so there's there's a lot of uh i think there's a lot of opportunity and sometimes at at this level it can feel overwhelming in terms of there's so much need and uh for for attention to this work and where where do you think you can put your emphasis to have the greatest return and impact on students. Um, and, and admittedly, I, I think as a emerging leader within this role, that's something that I'm learning and wrestling with and thinking about how can we continue to do this for, for the college and for our, our students and our faculty and staff. Well, that idea of being leaders and servant leaders, right, has come up a few times. And then also being like, together, accompaniers, guides, um, friends, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think all of those things uh, are sort of in the mix, right, as we kind of cycle through our different roles. Um, Diana, I wanted to ask you a similar question. So, you know, as the assistant provost uh, with authority over uh, student services broadly, um, can you speak a little bit to what you know, is specific to your role and what paradigm shifts, you know, maybe have excited you um, in terms of equity? It is um, equity from a um, strategic or scalable uh, perspective, you know, institution-wide is always something that is um, hard to implement because one size doesn't fit all. And I think that uh, many institutions have dedicated mentoring programs and activities that sometimes are capable of supporting a specific population or a small group of students. But we want to make sure that that is not uh, the only option. Mm -hmm. So for us here at COD, with the implementation of the Center for Student Success, which is where our navigators are, and having the capacity to build an infrastructure that helps students to learn that they can advocate for themselves. Uh, and that they have someone who can coach them if they trust and come back to that person. And we're, we're trying to do it from a proactive engagement way, similar to what our counselors also do when they're meeting students one-on-one, -on -one. you know, that engagement, that coaching capacity, but growing it and having more people who can do that expands that ability for us to be able to support each student unique needs. Um, from a financial angle also you know we are at a time where students who may in the past may not have needed uh, financial aid right now their situation at home could have changed and they will have to go and petition for their financial aid to be reviewed or to be uh, evaluated for professional judgment um, so how we implement and how we come we become more transparent uh, reaching out to students and letting them know that we have scholarships that are no longer requiring an SAT or ACT, uh, that we have the federal funds from CARISA or from the governor's emergency funding. Um, you know, we're about to start releasing the uh, HERF, you know, the additional uh, Department of Education release of funds uh, coming soon. So planning on how we make that very transparent and very uh, accessible for all students to come through and feel that they can secure funding without being intimidated. Um, so how we communicate, how we word it, where do we position the information, being strategic about using every possible way of communicating via, you know, via email, via social media um, is important. So I think from that perspective in, in roles like mine is how do we utilize all possible um, communication tools or possible strategies to reach as many of our students and for the ones that don't get to hear or see it, maybe hopefully through a friend, uh, spreading the news and spreading the word 
um, making sure that our faculty continue to be our advocates as well, because many times they are the ones who point students to a resource and say, you can secure a computer, you can secure some funding, and they are the ones pointing students to those resources. So it's being strategic is, is the best way that I can position that. Yeah, that's all really wonderful. And, you know, I think one of the things that's difficult to maybe communicate in um, a Zoom format um, and that's been, you know, difficult to overcome in this, you know, pandemic year, uh, you know, as I'm facilitating this and and you guys are, are um, talking about the things you're talking about, you know, what I see literally on the screen, right, is those, you know, tiles, like everyone's in a little separate tile, right, the faculty member, the assistant provost, the counselor, the dean, right. Um, but what a college really is, is all of those things pulling together, right, and working together. Um, so as we look at the future, um, which is hopefully in part a, you know, post-pandemic future. My children like to say pre-co and po-co, and I'm sort of hoping that that may catch on. We'll see if they go viral with that. Um, but, you know, as we're looking to that and we're looking to be able to come together um, in new ways and maybe, again, in somewhat more literal ways, what are you excited about sort of on the horizon here at the College of DuPage in terms of equity work? I think these times have really opened up for us to have very candid conversations that previously we were not having. And even though technology may not be um, 100% working for everybody the same way, we still have a population that generally, uh, even if it is through a cell phone, they can access you know, video or they can access information that we provide. So I think that we have, we have had during this pandemic an opportunity for people to hear of topics and engage and, and you know, if, even if it is through a post in a social media environment, uh, identify where the values of the institution are and how proactive we are or how active we are trying to address uh, topics of importance, you know, race and justice and equity and, um, you know, support to students. So I hope that that is um, something that in the post-COVID, uh, you know, time that we've, we've built at least a little bit more infrastructure that will keep us going. Um, and it's been very rewarding. And I've seen many people get engaged or be part of things that maybe on campus I will not have seen, uh, you know, because of demands or other, um, you know, expectations for, for their work. But I think that that's one of the things that we have gained out of this experience. And I would say that um, there have been a lot of professional development opportunities and, and cornerstone. Um, we've had at least two that I can think of that targeted uh, how do we deal with racism in this time that we're living in. Um, also, even before that, though, I think this this last past year, I saw a lot about Frida Kahlo. And if anyone didn't know who Frida was, if you spent one day at College of DuPage, now you're interested to find out who this woman was if you didn't know. And I think that cross-curricular study and that cross-cultural study where it's interwoven everywhere you go. I mean, they had Frida socks. You know, it was, it was within every department. So this is diversity that we all grabbed on and said, you know what, this is how I apply it to my subject area. And this is how it applies to you. And I, I'm really excited to see how we're going to finally get to see it, you know, once we get back on campus, all the hard work that we really did to bring in diversity and um, cross curricular studies so that it all fits in a theme and we're all moving in the same direction together. So um, I'm really excited to see how that turns out. I'll echo that. I, I think there's a lot of momentum that we're building. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we've heard in higher education, there's the concept of initiative fatigue and uh, where this, I feel, is becoming a part of our, our, our operational and our, our values culture. Um, this, this importance of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our work. It's, it's challenging us to really live up to the mission of community colleges, to, to live up to who uh, our community needs us to be, who our students need, need us to be. And, um, 
you know, th this is something that is impacting uh, a lot of deeper and, and hard conversations uh, across campus because it's, it's forcing us to look into the mirror. It's forcing us to think about uh, who we are as an institution, what we value, who we serve, and, and how we can challenge ourselves uh, to continue to do the good things that we've been doing and to improve upon the areas of, of, of gaps and, and outcomes. Uh, it, it's forcing a lot of those conversations that uh, we can't just walk away from. Uh, and, and so I think I, I'm excited to see um, some of the, the work that we're doing uh, translate into cultural and institutional change um, for, for the betterment of, of who we are for our community. So that, that, that's really what, what excites me uh, in this. And, um, and it's, it's happening, you can feel it, that things that have started perhaps in initial conversations and uh, small committees are now becoming truly campus-wide and it's uh it's exciting it's absolutely exciting to see so you know if you could say sort of one thing out there uh to the community that's listening to the students that are listening um what would you say i think my message um would be that this is work that we all have to do as a community uh every voice counts um equity can be identified as something that you know a study group could build equity you know students getting together and supporting a student who may have come with less preparation and lifting that particular friend or student to you know people like Jason helping students become their own advocates or advocating for others to um, any of us empowering students and I think it, it built, it's something that can be built. Um, and, you know, speaking about values and, and mission, I think it's something that we want to continue to convey for our departments to also integrate. Um, today, I had the opportunity to hear from uh, one of our teams in the equity team that developed a whole um, departmental level uh, infrastructure and plan for themselves to be able to work on equity and their own learning. So we all can can do, and we all can act on it and, and put a plan together uh, to build it at whatever level it could be. So I think that that would be my um, recommendation. I don't really have anything off the top of my head for like a message to students. Um, I would leave that to better messengers <laughs> than, than myself outside of my you know day-to-day -day class or classroom work. But I feel like my answer to both like two questions ago and a question ago, and maybe even as a concluding thought from my perspective, the teaching and learning kind of instructional design perspective is that what I think many people have experienced as part of the COVID moment where so much went remote, even though even if you're synchronous, like real time discussions, but it's not face to face, the role of the learning management system, which at COD is Blackboard, um, has become, I think, more and more um, uh, obvious for both teachers and students as the kind of like digital platform that mediates how teachers connect with students, how students connect with teachers, how students connect with each other and course content and course work. And I feel like the disciplinary shift or paradigm shift that's really been happening in composition studies or uh, online writing instruction is that people are becoming more and more aware and thus becoming more intentional about themselves as teacher, as, as web designer, thinking of the student as um, their end user in this sort of like uh, the questions about, are we designing our teaching learning experiences as mediated through uh, a learning management system? Are we designing with the user experience in mind? And I think the sort of like intersection now is that idea of designing for learning, teaching and learning experiences, but also are we designing for equitable teaching and learning experience, whether it's course or not course design, but assignment design, but also just basic like course navigation. Is it easy? Is it intuitive? And if it's not, like, are you asking your students actively, is my course easy to navigate or are you having trouble? You know, that's a fairly easy, easy, easy question to ask and pretty actionable um, feedback you're likely to get. 
And again, to like map equity onto that, it, it truthfully is equity work. Because if your course design is impeding certain people from being successful and sort of privileging others who have background knowledge and experience, who have a family situation with lots of college graduates who can walk them through where to likely quick click to find what kind of thing in a course layout, again, you're sort of exacerbating equity issues if we're not thinking strategically and intentionally, as, as others have said, about something as kind of like simple as course design. So again, it's not really a message to students, but it is a disciplinary shift that I'm seeing in our own field for Nicole and I, um, and also moving forward like that POCO moment. Um, do, we, do we retain the sense that we can do equity work in the very basic like click, click nuts and bolts work of designing courses or learning experiences using the LMS for students. Any last thoughts? Well, um, when I was having conversations with some of my students and I told them about this session <laughs> too, um, one thing that they asked me, they said, Ms. Ballantyne, you know, is this gonna be something that we just talk about? Or is this going to be something that we actually do? Because we don't want to talk about it and not do anything. So I told each of those students that I'm going to dedicate myself to it, uh, open myself to have um, conversations with whoever I can about the, the voice that the students have. Um, and I'm going to be available to you if you need me. Um, there are ways that that you can get in contact with me, even if our schedule is, is full. So um, I definitely reaffirm my commitment to them, but I would like students to um, reaffirm their commitment to share this voice because everyone is an individual and what experience you have might be different than another. We won't know how we can make it better for you if you don't take us there and show, show us. You know, So reach out to us and say, you know what, Miss Valentine, you committed to me. You said you were going to help. So now here I am. Tell me, what's my next step? You know, what do I do next? So I would just like students to commit as well so we can go on this journey together. Okay. And, I, and, and I would say to, to that in terms of our, our commitment and any messaging to the students and community is that we are, we are your college. And I, I, I hope that, um, you know, what you know, we strive to is whether it were your first choice or second, third, fourth, further down the list, that at the end of the day, that we're your best choice and that we're, we're committed to uh, to your success and, and your support uh, to support you here. And um, and that we can be challenged as well, that we are your your community's college. And if if there's ways that we are not serving the community, that that's for us to hear. And for us to really think about um, that, that I welcome, you know, that that challenge as well is, is are there things that, um, you know, and, and that's where the input from the community is is significant in terms of thinking, how are we, how, how are we in partnership with community organizations? How are we partnership with our, our local high schools? How are we uh, in partnership with local workforce uh, boards and organizations? Um, there, there's, there's so much that we're called to do in this work and um, that uh, I believe that that is welcomed because that, that, that's our role. And so, um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's, it's our role to, to be in service in this work. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for having this conversation and for pressing this conversation towards action. Um, really appreciate it. And thanks so much.